morning church how are we doing this morning well, it's a great day to be in the lord's house this morning let's sing together when all i see is the battle you see my victory when all i see is the mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, let's sing this out. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. When all I see, when all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. Oh, when all I see is a cross, God, you see it. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power. You shine in the shadows, you in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of you shine in the shadow, you in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted up. Oh, the battle belongs to you. Every I'll see you through the night. Oh, God. 
our battles for us. Amen. We'll go tell somebody about that. Let's shake a hand and let's hug a neck this morning.
in all of their beauty. I don't have to wonder, you know what you're doing. So why would I worry at all when you're faithful to a supply? Everything I need, everything I need, I know. My Father has it, my Father has it. Every single time, the Lord will provide. My Father has it, my Father has it. of tomorrow what it will bring if I have you I have enough cause your love will satisfy everything I need everything I need I know my father has it my father Every single time, the Lord will provide. My Father has it. My Father has it. Seek first the kingdom and his treasures and everything else it will be. Adding all that I'm needing. Oh, I know the Lord will provide. If you believe that today, let's sing it. Let's sing it. Because I know my God's not empty handed. Because he gives us blessings upon blessings. Oh, I'm still believing that I know the Lord will provide. And seek first the kingdom and its treasures and everything else it will be added all that I'm needing. I know the Lord will provide. Cause I know my God's not empty handed. Cause he gives us blessings. Upon blessing, oh, I still believe it. That I know the Lord will provide everything I need. Everything I need, everything I need. My Father has it, my Father has it. Every single time, the Lord will provide. Lord will provide my father has it. Seek first the kingdom and its treasures and everything else it will be added all that I'm needed. I know the Lord will provide. Cause I know my God's not empty handed. Cause he gives us blessings upon blessings. Oh, I'm still believing that I know the Lord will provide. I know the Lord will provide. I know the Lord will
water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got honey in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living well, only you can satisfy. Sweetness at the mercy seat. Now I've tasted, it's not hard to see. Only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock. 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 In the rock. Freedom where the spirit is, bounty in the wilderness, you will always satisfy. Oh, there's honey in the rock, water in the stone, and on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need. You keep giving, you keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. on the ground no matter where I go I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you've got there's honey in the rock purpose in your plan power in the blood healing in your hand started flowing when you said it is done Jesus who you are is This honey in the rock. This honey in the rock. This honey in the rock. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is. To trust in you, Jesus, oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude 
I can sing these songs as I often do. Every song must end, and you never do. So I'll throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. got one response I got just one look with my arms stretched wide I will worship you so I'll throw up my head and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a love Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So come on, my Oh, don't you get shy on me, look on your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Because you got a lion inside of those love. Get up and praise the Lord. So I'm throwing my praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah God, we just thank you for just the opportunity to 
lift our hands and praise your name for who you are and what you do in each and every one of our lives, God. We thank you that we have a place to come and worship you freely. God, we thank you for the freedom we have in you and we thank you for how you power us to do what you want us to do. We thank you for who you are. words for this day were to turn to his spirit and speak to each and every one of us. God, I pray that your word this morning would have power to do a mighty work in us. God, we just pray for you. And God, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to just worship you. And everybody said, amen. All right, well, Go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're in Titus, and we kicked off a new series last week talking about faithful followers, and we're going to be going through the book of Titus. Um, and so last week, we, we began that journey. Uh, and this week, as uh, I prepared and uh, continued in, in chapter one, uh, I began to think of something just chapter one made me reflect on. Uh, and this may seem odd right now, uh, but it made me think of the NFL draft, I am a football fan. Many of you probably already know that. I love football. Uh, I, love, I love high school football. I love college football. I love professional football. Um, I, I had a great, great weekend. Uh, I was able to go watch the Allen Eagles uh, completely destroy uh, Princeton. Um, and uh, then I got to watch the Texas Longhorns completely destroy the Oklahoma Sooners. And, and, and so, yeah, in the, you know, when I go and watch these things, you know, it's a, it, it, you know I get fired up, and uh, it's been a great weekend, so I'm, I'm praying that it continues today, and our Dallas Cowboys will totally obliterate the Detroit Lions. And I know that may make some of you sad, but that is what I'm, that is what I'm hoping for. But I think back, and in, 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 as a football fan, I really enjoy watching some of these college students um, graduate, move on, and, and fulfill their lifelong dream that they may have had to go into the NFL and, and play professionally. But one of the things that we don't get to see is all of the work in the background that goes on before the draft. And I'm not talking about the player that is preparing himself to go into the draft, that's physically training, that's working on all of his agility, that's making sure he's healthy. I'm talking about these teams. These teams have to be properly prepared as they get ready for draft week, that they have evaluated every single player on that draft board. You know, let's take the Dallas Cowboys, for example. You know, let's just say they have specific needs. They're going to prepare, and they're going to have specific men on their draft board that they know will meet those specific needs. Here's the thing, though. It's not just about if they need a good lineman being strong and big and being a good offensive lineman uh, in college. It's not about, you know, if they need a good cornerback just being fast and have great cover skills. You know, it's not about just being a, a quarterback back and being able to throw the ball very accurately and, and do well under pressure as you're in the game. They begin to evaluate these young men in all stages of their life. Like they, they go back and they begin to examine, you know, not just how they played football because, yeah, playing football is okay and, and it's good and that's what they're going to be doing, but they go back and they begin to evaluate their character while they were in high school. They begin to, to evaluate their work ethic. They begin to ask people about their reputation. They begin to dig deep. Not only, is it a, is it, not only do they undergo physical tests, not only are they made sure that they're healthy physically and that they're agile and they can perform the duties that they have, they also make sure that their minds are sharp that their minds are in tune to whatever's going to take place in that football game, that they're emotionally strong, that they're, that they're not going to come under siege and then just break emotionally. And so they begin to look at all of these different things and test these things before they ever will decide if they're going to draft that individual. 
And, and, and it is a, it's, a, it's a rigorous thing, and you think about it should be because they invest millions and millions of dollars into these players. So today as we get into our text, when we start to look at our scripture, we realize that Titus is given some specific requirements for a pastor, an elder, an overseer, those that are put in charge of the church. And they're pretty high standards. And they should be, right? They, you should hold your pastor, the elders of the church, the overseers of the church, all of those names run together. Bishop, that, that, that would run in the same context. Pastor, overseer, bishop, elder. All of those, that's the same. If you hear somebody call somebody a pastor or an elder, that's the same as a bishop or an overseer. That's the, that is the title that the Bible gives them, and historically that's what they were called, to hold the office of pastor. And so what happens in Titus is Titus has been given some instruction that he is supposed to go, and he's actually supposed to fill the pulpit of multiple churches. Titus had the job to go and make sure that qualified men that met the qualifications that are lined out in Scripture and given that he, those qualifications were met by the men he selected, that he appointed, that he ordains to go into the ministry. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's read in Titus chapter 1. Um, last week we ended in verse 4, so I'm going to start in verse 4 this week. And we're going to read down through verse 9. Uh, and to honor the Lord and his word, would you please stand with me if you're capable. And again, Titus chapter 1, verse number 4. To Titus, my true child in common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if a man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dispensation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sword gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teachings so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Heavenly Father, God, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for the instruction that we receive from it. We are grateful for the encouragement that we receive from it. And, Lord, we're grateful for the sanctification that comes through it. Lord, as we read through your word today, as we study your word, may each and every one of us um, be in the process of sanctification. May you be sanctifying our hearts through your word. Lord, may we be challenged and look at our own lives, testing ourselves according to your word. And, uh, Lord, if there is anyone here that does not know you, uh, Lord, I pray that today, today they would follow you that today would be the day that they believe, they place their faith in Christ, that they trust you, and that today they would be born again. And so, God, this is what we are asking, and we are trusting you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So today we dive into this letter that's written by Paul to Titus. And in this letter, it's a reminder of the instruction that Paul gave to Titus when he left him in Crete. Now, historically, we don't really know when that was. You can go back and you can begin to explore um, the, the Pauline missionary journeys. That's when Paul went around to the different areas of, of Greece and, and uh, Asia Minor, uh, planting churches and encouraging churches. Um, I got the great opportunity last summer to go on a trip um, to Greece all in this region where Crete is, visiting the islands that Paul uh, had visited and that Paul had ministered on and that Paul had planted churches on. 
Uh, and, and what a blessing that was to go and stand in some of the places where not only Paul, but even great, uh, great leaders like Titus stood and, and proclaimed the word of God. And so what we know from this is that at some point, Paul and Titus had made a trip to Crete together. And while they were there, they noticed some things, that there were unhealthy churches. Um, there, were, there were multiple churches, we know this, um, but they were unhealthy. And the reasons that they were unhealthy is because they did not have, number one, qualified leadership, and number two, they had false teachers. And so the purpose of Paul getting with Titus, leaving him there is to set all of this in order. Like you've got to go correct all these things. And when you're going to correct these things, it starts with you putting the man of God in the right place at the right time. I want you to understand something. I believe this. I believe in churches today that there are churches, so-called churches, people that call themselves churches, and they have men in the pulpit that are unqualified and don't meet these qualifications. One of the things that I challenged you as a congregation last week is if you feel God calling you, you feel him calling you out to end a ministry, to be a, a pastor, you know, to be a missionary, to be a servant of the Lord wherever he calls you to go, uh, one of the challenges is that you would look at this text today and you would test yourself by it. Uh, as the pulpit committee met with me, you know, months and months ago, uh, I hope and I believe that you took this text and the text out of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And you took that text and you said, this is the man that we're looking for. And I hope that as you looked and you settled in on me that you said he meets these qualifications. Because that's what Titus was instructed to do. In verse 5, it, Paul told him, he said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So it's past tense. So he's already given him the instruction. He's probably already told him all these things. And now he's writing him a letter because Titus might be a lot like me. If he doesn't have the notes in front of him, he's going to forget. He'd be like, what was that third qualification? You know, that kind of thing. And so Paul wrote it down by the inspiration of the Lord, sent it to Titus. And today we have the qualifications of a pastor, elder, overseer, bishop. Um, so what is a follower of Christ is the question. Because that's the title of our message, right? That's the title of our series um, is a faithful follower so today we're going to look at the requirements of what it takes to lead people to be faithful followers of Christ um, and setting an example of what a faithful follower looks like. Uh, and so the first example that we see set when we talk about faithful followers, men of God, pastors, the first example they must set is an example in the home. The first example is an example that is in the home. It's set at home. Titus 1 verse 6 says this, namely, if any man is above, above reproach, the husband uh, of one wife um, and having children who believe, not accused of dispensation or rebellion, namely, if a man is above reproach, that's where we start. If a man is above reproach, the example that's set in home is that he must be above reproach in his home. He must be, the way that he lives, when it talks about being above reproach, it's talking about him living a blameless life, something where he could not be accused. Somebody can't make false accusations against him because um, he's got such a great reputation they would look and they would say, no, there's no way that that pastor, that that elder, that that deacon, there's no way that he would do that. I can't believe that because he has such a great reputation. When false accusations would arise, they would immediately be shot down because of the great reputation that the man would hold. And so that's what it talks about. When it talks about that if any man is above reproach, it's talking about him being blameless and beyond accusations. He's got an upstanding character. 
All right? And then it says, the husband of one wife. I want you to understand something. This has been um, what, you, what I would say is something uh, contradictory in the churches. Um, for years, um, for years, I grew up in a church, um, and, and the, they interpreted this scripture as meaning uh, a man can't be divorced. That's not true. That's not what the scripture says. All right, I, I want you to understand that is not what Paul wrote. Now, it may be what, you know, Brother Bill may have taught you 40 years ago, but Brother Bill obviously did not look at the Greek text in which Paul wrote to get the meaning of what's going on. Now, are you saying, well, then it doesn't matter if you're divorced? I did not say that because I believe divorced also plays a little bit for the purpose, whatever a man would have gotten divorced for, how many times he's gotten divorced, I think all of those things play into the, what this text is saying. The text here, when it says the husband of one wife, literally means a one-woman man. A one-woman man. And that's not even, though it, it's referring to polygamy, because polygamy is not biblical. We should not have more than two wives. That's still not what it's talking about. He's not addressing polygamy in the church. What Paul is addressing is a man that has the reputation that he is a one-woman man. He is faithful to his wife. See, the problem that we have with, well, a man can't be divorced. Well, you know what we end up when that's the interpretation of that scripture? We end up with a man that's been married for 40 years to the same woman. He's treated her miserably, and he has four girlfriends. And he can't be, a, he can't be an elder or a deacon, because by the way, these qualifications run side by side with a deacon in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So he can't be a leader, an elder, a pastor, overseer, bishop, a deacon, because he's been divorced. That's not what the scripture is saying. So, so we end up in our churches with these men that abuse their wives, uh, that aren't faithful to their wives, that have multiple relationships outside of their wife. And then we've got a guy sitting over in the corner that got converted 30 years ago, had a bad marriage, uh, you know, 40 years ago, got divorced, but has been living faithfully with the same woman for 30 years, loving her and walking her through life, being by her side. And he would have never even thought about ever being unfaithful to her for the last 30 years because he got converted right when he got married. But he's divorced and he can't be an elder, but the guy over here with four girlfriends, he can that makes no sense, does it? You know why that doesn't make sense? Because for years, men in, in misinterpreted this text. Men misinterpreted this text. Now, yes, if a man got divorced, he was unfaithful to his wife. He married another woman. He's unfaithful to her too. He doesn't show any signs of being faithful. In fact, he's not blameless because everybody knows he's a cheating scoundrel. Guess what? His divorce disqualifies him. But the text is saying it's a one-woman man that he is faithful to the wife that God has given him, that he loves her, as the Scripture tells us, as Christ loves the church. So he is above reproach because people would look, and I hope people look at me, and they would say that, man, Pastor Craig loves Miss Mona. He would never, never sneak out on her. He would never do those things. He really, really loves her. He cares for her, and he is faithful to her. That's what I hope that you see. Now, yes, I've never been divorced. I've never had another wife. She's the only wife that I've had. But if, if I would have had a wife when I was 18, got divorced at 19, and got saved at 21, and have faithfully lived with her like I have for the last 26 years, I believe I would still be qualified to be your pastor today. It's talking about this reputation that the, that the, that the elder has within the community, how he treats his wife, how his wife looks to him. And also... The second thing that we see there is that he has children who believe. When he sets his example in the home, his children are an example of him as well. The way that he has raised his children, 
the way that his children lived their lives. Now, this scripture right here is pretty clear when you begin to look at it. And this can cause some problems too. Because sometimes, and I get it, when we, when we are older and we're adults and our kids are out of our house, uh, we have no control over them. Some people take that like, okay, once they're out of my house, now I can go and I can be a, 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 an elder or I can go and I can take the office of, of a bishop. I can go step into that role because my kids are out of my house and so they're no longer running around wild and they're not believers and they can do whatever they want to. They can live however they want to and do whatever they want to, but now I'm cleared because they're gone. I'm not too sure that's what this scripture says. See, the first thing that the first requirement is that his children are believers. Now, it's obvious. When I first became a pastor, um, this would have been in 2006. In 2006, I pastored my first church in Waxahachie, Texas. My children, neither one of them were believers at the time. Because in 2006, I had a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And neither one of them had enough, had, had a knowledge to truly believe. But they were getting there. I mean, they understood the basics. They had a very simple belief of who Jesus was. They just didn't have enough yet to truly place their faith in Christ. But they did that as they got older. Did they, were they perfect? Oh, no, they weren't perfect. They weren't, they weren't perfect at all. Um, they, there were, you know, they, they had problems. They made mistakes. Just like everybody else's kids do, so do pastor's kids. They've got to work those things out. I'll tell you, one of the greatest, one of the greatest compliments I ever got about one of my children was about my daughter. And, uh, you know, as a parent, you, you, you have blinders sometimes on, right, with your kids, um, I've tried to always not have those blinders on because I can't properly run my household with blinders on. And, and so, but one of the greatest, greatest compliments I ever got was a man that was teaching a young teenage boy's Sunday school class came to me. And he said, Pastor, I want to introduce myself. And he introduced himself to me. And he said, I just want to tell you that I'm at the church down the road and uh, I am the Sunday school teacher for the high school teenage boys. I said, oh, awesome. Well, you know, nice to meet you. And he says, I want to tell you something because I believe that you need to know this and I believe that you should be extremely proud. He said, we sat in, that, we sat in our Sunday school room and I asked these boys, I want you to think about the most godly individual, the person that loves Jesus the most at school and stands out. And almost unanimously, they said it was your daughter. And I said, Wow, that was amazing. I mean, as a dad, you know, when you have kids, both my kids were active in sports. Um, I was just telling somebody the other day, I mean, Grant played football, basketball, golf, fishing. He did everything he could to get out of school, right? Um, so he knew dad wouldn't let him stay home, so he just played everything that he could. Um, and my daughter really did the same. She wasn't much different. She played a little bit of basketball and volleyball, big into volleyball. She even played on the golf team to get out of school, right? Um, and you want, you know, I, I, you, you long sometimes as a dad especially to hear, you know, great compliments of how well your kids do in sports and different things like that. And I received those compliments about both my children. But when you receive that kind of compliment, that says, okay. People outside my house see that I'm doing something right. That's what the scripture's talking about. That, that it's noticeable. You're above reproach. People even see it in your kids. And so having children who believe, not accused of, of dispensation or rebellion. I want you to understand that word right there when it talks about dispensation. It's really talking about prodigal living. When you go back to the prodigal son, and it says, not many days later, the younger son gathered together, uh, everything together, and he went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Those two words, dispensation and that loose living, are closely, closely tied. And so what that tells me is that if you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, that probably disqualifies you from being an elder. 
And you won't probably hear that preached. Because I get it. In our day and age, we have so many people, kids, walking away from the faith as they get into their 20s and the world pulls them in. But I would also look at that scripture and say, but, Dad, Mom, if that kid comes back like the prodigal son did, you did, you did your job. Because things are going to happen. But in the midst of looking at a qualified deacon, elder, pastor, bishop, a qualified leader of the church, their children play a huge role. And when we look at that last one, most likely that means adult children. That's not talking just about your kids at home. That's what people try to do. They try to say, well, once my kids leave the house, then I'll be okay. They can go how, live however they want to. That's their own free will and their own choice. Yes, it is. But it's also a reflection of you. That's what the Bible says. And so we see right there in the scripture that our example is set in our home. But the second thing that we see is the example is set in public. Our, we should, people in public ought to see that we live a life for Christ. They ought to see and know that, hey, there's a man of God. Listen, I, I know this probably disappoints most of y'all, right, that I don't wear a suit. Um, I, I don't believe, uh, maybe some of y'all it just disappoints, um, I do believe that when it cools off, you may see me in a sports jacket. It is just way too hot up here um, to put on a jacket, uh, especially when it's 90-some degrees outside. Uh, but I do agree that we should uh, wear our best, what we consider our best. We should try to show, show ourselves as I am honoring the Lord with what I wear. Um, and so I believe if you went and looked in my closet, you would think this was pretty God-honoring, uh, you know, because I could have worn my basketball shorts and a T-shirt. That would have been bad, right? But I think that the way we live and the way that we show ourselves in public, I think that that matters. One day I was at a, a, a little Italian restaurant, and uh, it was after church, and we were sitting around a table. You know, we did our normal. We ate, we prayed, we talked. Um, you know, I am really not the super, uh, you know, I, I don't, I have a very, what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm, I'm hesitant sometimes. I don't want to be the Pharisee out in public that stands on the street corner and beats his chest so everybody hears him talk and says, no, I'm a pastor. Um, I, I tend to want to just sort of blend in, but if you have a conversation with me, you'll probably figure out real quick that, oh, okay, wait a second, this guy, he's a pastor. But one day I went to pay, and I'm just sitting at this table, and as I'm paying out my ticket, this young lady looked at me, and she goes, I bet you're a pastor, aren't you? And I said, how in the world did you know that? She said, I could just tell. And I said, you know what? That's one of the greatest compliments I've ever received. Because I didn't tell her. I don't think anybody else told her. You know, it was just for some reason she saw something, and that's what she said. And, and I think that people in public ought to be able to recognize by the way that we live our lives, by the way that we operate, that we are not just children of God, but that we are faithful followers. And so a pastor's uh, should... His example should be seen in public. In Titus 1 7, it says, For the overseer, again, it's repeated, must be above reproach as God's steward. A steward would be somebody that would serve in a house to make sure that a house would stay in order. And so, as a good steward of God that manages his house, we ought to be above reproach, again, blameless. People ought to look at us and say, Man, okay. He's got his stuff together. He truly is following Jesus. And then it gives a bunch of negatives. Like, this is who you shouldn't look like. Like, it says, not self-willed. That's like living in a life of, like, self-arrogance. You're not self-willed. You're not all about yourself. You're not always trying to, to, trying to please yourself. Like, you would, you would step on anybody to get your way. Here's one of the things, here's a, one of the things that, um, there's two words that, that, that come and are associated many times with pastors. The word of manipulation and persuasion. And I want to explain to you the difference. 
Because manipulation, that's what a self-willed man does. The self-willed man will manipulate people for his benefit. That he will use his gift of persuasion to manipulate individuals so that he benefits from it. Persuasion is completely different. And I believe persuasion is a gift and a gift that pastors should use from the pulpit. And persuasion is to persuade people to do something for their benefit. It's not going to benefit me. It's going to change your life. It's not going to benefit me. It's going to benefit you. And a self-willed man is going to manipulate. If you know any pastors that can be manipulative, they manipulate situations for themselves. You know a pastor that can be persuasive and persuade you so that whatever you're going to do, he's persuading you to do. That's so that it will benefit you. And so we see you, that a pastor, an uh, elder, an uh, overseer should not be self-willed and should not be quick-tempered. You know, this was right here. This is one of those things that God probably worked on me. You ask my wife. Uh, when we first got married, uh, it wasn't long after that we got married that I truly believed the Lord saved me. Um, and, and one of the things that I had to f- fix one of the things the Lord fixed in me was a quick temper. Like I, I was quick. Now I would have never hit my wife or abused my children. I wasn't raised that way. But man, I was quick tempered. And what I mean by that, I can remember one time, and I mean this was kids were really little. Mona and I got in a fight. We were arguing. I got so mad. I kicked the coffee table. The coffee table flipped up and stuck in the wall of our brand new house. And this was t- over probably 20 years ago. And I, I just, I look back and I think, man, I was so quick-tempered, so easily aggravated, so quick. You know, you have that, that fuse that it's just, it's, you know, like a firecracker. You know, I, I used to be so scared with those little, the, not the black cats, but the little bitty red ones. I don't know what they were called. But you light that thing and you had to get rid of it quick because that fuse was going to go out and it was going to explode. And that's, what, that's, that's how my anger was. But if you ask my wife, um, as, God began, as God saved me and his sanctification process began to go, you ask her, as our kids grew up, the one that was the most patient, the one that could sit there even when they've made us you know, completely uh, messed up and could have a conversation with them was me. Like God just did something. And, and that, that fuse that he gave me, it, just, it was like he just kept making it longer and making it longer and making it longer. That, it, that quick temper just went away. And so he should not be self-willed. He should not be quick-tempered. And he should not be addicted to wine. You know, wine, that, that's talking about wine does not have a hold on you. you you're, you're not addicted to it. It doesn't, it doesn't have its clamps on you. And now you say, well, Pastor Craig, what is it? Should we drink at all? Listen, I cannot tell you that the Bible says do not drink. All right? I can tell you that I have a personal conviction. I do not drink. I abstain from alcohol. And the reason that I do is because, number one, I believe that I'm to set a good example. And and regardless, if I had one drink or ten, you wouldn't know it if you walked into Chili's and saw me drinking a margarita. You would just assume that your pastor's a drinker. And so, number one, I abstain. Number two, I don't want to cause somebody else to stumble, that that would give them the freedom to because I've seen that happen. Because the truth is I'm the oldest of four, of four sons. Uh, and I can't, I can't say I always abstained from alcohol uh, because there was a point, number one, that I didn't have that conviction and that I wasn't saved. Uh, but this was like 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But I had four younger brothers. And little, bro- little brothers look up to their big brother like he is the example. Like I want to be like him. And I can remember my youngest brother one time seeing me uh, with a 12-pack of beer in my hand uh, and a blonde on, the other, on my arm. And he looked at me and he said, I want to be just like him. My younger brother died at 33 from alcoholism. I don't drink. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that any of you should. I wish you all had that same conviction. Is that a historical conviction in the Bible? No, it's not. I mean, here's the truth. Uh, It shocks people when I say this. I never really thought about it. 
Do you realize that for 2,000 years in our New Testament church, we pretty much took wine with communion. So everybody came in the church and drank. For 2,000, like only in the prohibition did wine leave the church. And around the world today, and even in America, you still see wine served at communion. And in America is where we've taken it out. It, for years, the church said that, that wine was good and we take it at communion. Um, but the truth is, we don't do that today. It's a different culture. It is still the fruit of the vine that Christ talks about in Matthew, representing his blood, which is the most important thing. And it still holds to my conviction because I prefer that, lips, that alcohol does not touch my lips because I've seen the damage that it does, especially in our culture. The, the scripture there says that he must not be addicted to wine, uh, nor pugnacious. I think I, I think I read that wrong a while ago. These words like pugnacious, I, when, I get, when I look at them, they, they mess my mind up. I can practice pugnacious for, you know, 15 times, and then when I have to finally say pugnacious, then it's going to mess up and come out pugnacious or pugnacious or something. Never comes out right, but I think I've got it. The word is pugnacious. You know what that means? A striker or a brawler. Somebody that would hit you, you know? I, I, I don't know about you, but um, you, don't, you, you probably don't want a pastor that's going to turn around and smack you upside your head every time you do something wrong. Um, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about somebody that's prone to physical violence. Like that's how they solve their problems. You know, it, if you've ever met somebody that as soon as you disagree with them, the first thing they do is they roll up their sleeves and say, I know how we can handle this. That's pugnacious. They want, it's always about a, a, a physical altercation. And then last is not fond of sordid gain. They're not given in to greed. It's not all about money. It's, now, I want you to understand that doesn't mean that you should not pay your pastor. All right, I am very appreciative. Uh, and I believe that you do well uh, at taking care of me and taking care of my family. And I believe that's scriptural. But what this is talking about is people that would go back, remember self-willed, that they would manipulate things in order to get a sordid gain. They would take advantage of people. Um, I, was, I, was reminded, uh, I was reminded about that not too long ago. Um, I had bought a car. I was going to flip this car, if you know what I mean. I'm making a little extra money. I like to do stuff like that. Uh, my friend Matt and I, we've done that. We bought an old house, fixed it up, flipped it. Uh, me and Grant, we bought a car uh, back several months ago. Y'all might have saw it for a month. It was a little Volkswagen. We bought it at a little auction, and then we turned around, cleaned it up, and flipped it to make a little money. I ended up selling it to a, a, a friend of mine that I'd known for like 25 years, 30 years, but I hadn't seen him in a long time. He was at church with me back when I was a youth pastor. And as we were finishing everything, Grant probably remembers this, and I'm, I've talked, we've, we've settled in on a price. He said, now wait a second. Wait a second. Am I talking to Craig, the pastor, or Craig, the car salesman? <laughs> you know? You know what I'm talking about, Right? And the truth is, um, what the scripture is saying is you ought to always, even if I'm selling a car or a house, anything I'm doing, I ought to always be operating as a pastor. And, and that's what I told him. No, you're talking to Craig the pastor. Like I've, I've, it doesn't mean that this car's not going to break down on you in, in two months because I have no clue. What I can tell you is I'm being honest and I'm giving you what I believe is a good price. And I believe you can verify those things. I'm not out for a sword gain. I'm not trying to rip anybody off, right? Um, but I'm wanting to actually help you out. And so we see, those, we see those examples set right there. But then it goes into verse eight. And verse eight gives us the positive, right? The positives, like, okay, so if we're not supposed to be things, those things, what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be hospitable, right? We're supposed to be generous to our guest. The word there uh, that, it, that talks about hospitable comes from the word phileos, which is love. Like if, you're, if you know the word phileo, that's brotherly love. So this would be like to not just love your brother, but the last part of it means stranger, so it's like to love strangers so that when people that you don't know come in, we should treat them like family. 
like when I get to meet people for the very first time, I hope that they meet me and say, okay, he was a nice guy. I want to go see him again because he's hospitable. He's nice. He has a nice greeting. And then once you see me again, I hope that you feel the same way. Once you spend time with me and we get to hang out, I hope it's even greater, right? But it's hospitable that you are friendly to, to those not only that you know, but even to those that you don't know and that you love what is good. It says, love what is good. Those are the good things, and those are good people. You know, it, it, it's loving what is good. You want to see good take place. And when I say, you know, well, what, is it, what do you mean by loving good? What is loving bad? Well, if you had bad friends, and you constantly hung around them, and they're doing bad things, and y'all know what bad things are, I could give you a whole list of them. And usually when those bad things take place, most people have alcohol in their hand. So this goes back to my conviction on alcohol. I believe in our culture today that alcohol is not a good thing because of the way our culture treats it and abuses it. That's why I abstain. But here it's like you love the good things and the good people and you're known by that. And then you look and and it's not just loves the good things, but you're sensible. That is being of sound mind. Like you make solid decisions. You think things through in a godly way. It, you know, to, to be the opposite of this is to be crazy, to not be sane. Nobody wants a crazy pastor. You want somebody that is thinking things through, that has a clear mind. It actually goes really well with not being addicted to wine because really what this is talking about is being sober-minded. You're not letting anything affect the way that you think. You are clear in every single thing that you do. It's the way that, that you operate. But Warren Wearsby says, though, that to be sensible does not mean that you have to have no sense of humor or that he is always solemn and sober. Rather, it suggests that he knows the value of things and does not cheapen the ministry of the gospel and the message by foolish behavior. That's what it means to be sensible. And the next one is just. You're going to be just. You're going to be found fair. That also sort of goes back to selling that car. I want to be known that I'm, I'm not just trying to rip somebody off, but I'm fair. And I'm not only fair in the way I, uh, you honor people, but a pastor should be fair in the way that he judges people. Because here's the truth. Um, I know you think the Bible says that we're not supposed to judge anyone. But the truth is we're supposed to be hold each other accountable. And, you're, and your biggest accountability person should be your pastor, should be the elders of your church. If they catch you getting out of line and they catch something that's not right, they should be able to call you on it. They should be able to try to correct that. That's what we're looking at here in Titus. Titus was called to set things in order. It wasn't that the, the pews were out of, you know, out, of, out of place. It wasn't that the chairs weren't aligned and he had to set them in order. It's the people. And so when you go and you set those people in order and you correct those things, you got to do it out of love. you got to do it from the right heart, but you have to be just and fair. I'm not going to correct, correct Matt for something that he's done, but then not also correct Mike because he's done the same thing. I'm not going to show favoritism. If they've both done the same thing that is dishonoring to the Lord, they should both equally be corrected. And that's what it means to be just. That you'd have a leader that is just, that is fair, and that is devout. That, de that, that word devout, that's a characteristic of holiness. That you are devout, you are devout, you are, you are sold out for the Lord, you are following him. Remember, I was just telling somebody this, holiness does not mean, holiness does not mean that you're perfect. Holiness means you are set apart for the Lord. All of these things right here, Aren't, aren't evidence of a perfect life. They're evidence of somebody that believes they're set apart for the Lord. They're trying to live a life of holiness, godliness, a life devoted to the Lord and to follow him. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And the last good one was self-controlled, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? We should always be under self-control. We should be in control of our actions, our mind, our emotions, 
everything that we do, we should be in control of. And so we see that people ought to see that. When we live out in, in public and, and we are operating amongst people, they ought to see that. But the last thing, the example is set in service. The example is set in service. In Acts chapter 6, that's when you find deacons were instituted into the church. The elders slash apostles slash overseers slash bishops, whatever you want to call these 12 men that first started the church, they were operating as elders, pastors. And as they were operating, they got an influx of people and there was a weight upon them to handle the things in the church like tables, serving Lord's Supper, helping people, helping widows, helping orphans, you know, going on hospital visits. They, all the, they were putting all these things on the pastors, and there wasn't nobody doing anything else. And so they said, listen, here's what we do. We get deacons. These are servants of the church, but we're going to have men that are set apart. They're going to meet the same qualifications as an elder or a pastor, but their job their job is not to preach the word, and to, it's not the ministry of the word or the ministry of prayer. Their job is the ministry of the people. See, the pastor's job, what it shows us in Acts chapter 6 is, their job is the ministry of prayer and the word. And the deacon's job is the ministry of the people. And so in the midst of that, that's why this is entitled an example set in service. Because this, Titus is supposed to go out and find pastors overseers, elders. They're supposed to, in verse 9, hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with teaching. Hold fast to the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. To hold fast that means like you're holding on for your life. You're not going to let go. You know, I got that wild bulldog named Diesel, and he loves to play. And if he has a toy or a rope or a blanket, he gets his grip on that thing. You, you can't, he won't let go. Like I could literally swing him, and his, his teeth are going to grip down on whatever it is, and he will not let go. He will hold fast to whatever toy that is because he believes that he needs it, that that is his. And that is how we are to hold to the word of God, to the truth of the word of God. We have to realize that when we are followers of Christ, when Christ is my king, his word is my truth. And we hold fast to that word. We don't let go of it. it is our, this is where we get our authority from. This is how we, this is how we teach. And so a, a, a preacher, a pastor, an elder must hold fast to the word of God as he serves the church and he does the ministry of prayer in the word, and so it says that he, will, that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine, which means to teach and instruct, and to refute those who contradict. Because when people contradict the word, my first job is to refute that, especially in the context of the church. Somebody comes in this church, whether it be from this platform or for a Sunday school class, if they say something contrary to what the Word of God says, my job is to correct it. My job is to confront them because of what's happening in Titus in Crete. Like you've had these false teachers sneak in. They've snuck into the church. They're causing problems. Their, their views aren't aligned with God's word. And that is why Paul is telling Titus, this is what men have to look like. If you're going to put them in positions of authority, this is what they have to look like. In 2 Corinthians, here's what he told the church in Corinth. He said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. People are always trying to make their way into the church and into church leadership to water down the word and to hurt the church. And the elders and pastors, overseers, their job is to correct that and to make sure you don't come in here and hurt any of my people. 
God has put those people in authority, and that's what he's telling Titus to go do. So here's the question, though, that you should ask, right? So, so what is this? You know, I don't know if we have any, anybody out here that, that really, you know, you aspire to be a pastor, you're, you're working as a pastor. What are, you know, you can, that would have definitely apply to you, and I hope it challenges you. But what about just for the normal person, Right? Well, pastor, how does, how does this, looking at these qualifications, these standards that are set for a, an elder or a deacon, how does this apply to me, you know? Well, understand that what you see here is the example that is set. God has called pastors to be the example that you see. You're held to the same standard. This is what a faithful follower looks like. Just because you don't stand up here, just because you don't have a title, elder, pastor, overseer, bishop, doesn't mean you're not held to these same standards as well. This is the expectation. In 1 Timothy, uh, Paul wrote to the young pastor in verse 12, chapter 4, let no one look down on you for your youthfulness. Y'all remember that? Y'all have heard that verse. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, show yourself as an example. He's the example that church is supposed to follow. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who led you. Those are the pastors, the overseers, the teachers who spoke the word of God to you, it says in verse 7. And considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. What we have here is not just an example of requirements for pastors. This is required of all of us. And the pastor is just supposed to set the example He's supposed to teach you these things. And so today you should be challenged by the word. How do these things fit in your life? You know, the greatest example we have is Jesus. And we're reminded in Ephesians 5, chapter 1, verse chapter 1 and 2, it's, or chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also walked in love. And he gave himself up for you as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Maybe the real reason that you look at all these requirements and you think you can't accomplish any of that isn't because, you know, you just can't do it. But maybe it's because your heart truly hasn't been transformed. See, when Christ died on the cross and rose again for our salvation, he promised us a gift. That gift is the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that empowers men to live godly lives. It's the Holy Spirit that produces love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. It's the Holy Spirit that helps you have self-control and be faithful stewards of God. It's the Holy Spirit that guides you into truth. And maybe the truth is you don't have the Spirit of God inside of you. Today, you can Today, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again, and that he is the only way to salvation, the only way you can be saved, then today you can have eternal life. You can know Christ, and you can start on that road of sanctification and holiness. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God, for men that are called out, I think about my life and I think about men in my life, Lord, that you called out and made a, a, a positive influence on me as they lived out godly lives. And Lord, uh, that's a challenge. It's a challenge for me. My flesh is a challenge. And I know that it's a challenge for the church that you've uh, put me in charge of. Lord, I know it's a challenge for all of us that we, we wake up every day and our flesh wants to do the things of the world but, Lord, I pray it's our heart, a heart that you've transformed, that is leading us into righteousness and directing us to follow you. Lord, to be a faithful follower of Christ, we must first believe. And, Lord, if there's anybody here today, Lord, that has not truly believed in the salvation that you offer, I pray that today is that day. I pray that today they will receive that salvation and tell somebody. But, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we're all convicted by the requirements that we read that we are all supposed to follow. Lord, maybe there's some things in our life today that we need to correct. Maybe there's some things in our life that we need to confess. 
Maybe there's some things in our life, Lord, today um, that we need to lay down at your feet. And Lord, you give us an opportunity to do that, and we are grateful for it. And so, Lord, as we open up this time of response, Lord, I pray your children will respond. Lord, if you've pricked their heart about something that they need to correct in their life, Lord, I pray that they'll come before you as their king and get those things corrected. Lord, I, I pray if there's, if there's people in here today that don't know you, I pray that today they will find, uh, they'll find the faith to believe and put their trust in you. And I pray they will tell, they'll tell me. But Lord, we give this invitation to you and this time to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing this one last song. This is your time of response. And so, listen, if you have something, maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I need help with my temper. Pastor, I need help with this. I need help with that. If you'd like somebody to pray with you about those things, that's what elders, that's what pastors do. It's the ministry of prayer in the Word. Maybe you're here today and you say, I am called, I believe, to ministry. And I've got some struggles. And I need your help. Would you come talk to me? Maybe you're here today and you just want to thank the Lord. It's a great time to do that. Let's sing this song together.